break. Hurry, Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Looking at your house and saying to yourself, so if my spouse is really having a problem here, um, finding things, maybe we really just really need to label things, right? Maybe you need to label the drawer that has socks and shirts and underwear, et cetera, because for that person, they're no longer going to be able to just kind of go through the drawers and start rustling through everything. They're not going to find what they're looking for. Similarly, label the phone, put an emergency number on the phone, get pictures that are next to the phone, label the contents. We already talked about that. Label actually rooms and doors. Uh, doors that you want to encourage people to go to, people that you don't want, or doors that you don't want to encourage people to go to. Literally, one of the suggestions that has been made, which has been very effective, is just to put stop signs on doors. Put stop signs on the doors for the folks where you don't want them to be going into that space. And certainly, doing, putting a no soliciting sign at your house, because you don't want to be leaving and finding somebody showing up at the door who is soliciting, right? your spouse who has Alzheimer's disease. You want to be trying to secure and modify pieces of the house where you can do that. Specifically, you want to be dealing with doors. One of the concerns that you may have is that your loved one may be wandering. You need to make sure that your doors are secure. Uh, one of the suggestions, obviously, you want locks is to put up locks either at the top of the door or at the bottom of the door because people with Alzheimer's will typically if they don't see the lock that's right in front of them, they don't get it. They won't look to unlock other parts of the door. Using alarms and bells, placing curtains on covers that are at eye level so people can read them, installing safety bars, and installing covers on the doors on the handles that you don't want these people to be using a lot. All of these things are things that you can now find at the hardware store. One of the things that amazed me when I first heard this presentation is I came to appreciate that the goal of the exercise, if you're living with somebody with Alzheimer's, is really to be kind of going room by room and trying to figure it out. It's almost like, it was like the approach that I would think from an engineer. It was going through and saying, oh yeah, I get it now. There are certain kind of general strategies for how to make the house safe. We're going to apply them every place. Another example, one of the products that's available now, just window bars, so that you can keep people from opening the window to the whole size of the window so that people aren't going to be falling out of that window, right? Um, making sure that you have smoke detectors, making sure that there aren't wires like this one that I have running across here, that you don't have electrical cords around the house where there's some likelihood that somebody is going to slip. Making sure if you have somebody who is mostly in the house and, is, and the dementia is starting to progress, uh, that has an escape plan. Making sure that you've actually practiced with that person when they're in the house, if there's an emergency, if there's smoke, what do they do? Um, because for a person who has dementia, the more that you can practice that so that it's just an automatic thing and so that they're not worried about trying to remember things, the more likely that they're going to succeed. Um, the same thing is true room by room. One of the things that I found out has been invented, one of the most common concerns of folks with dementia is leaving the stove on. So there are now actually automatic stove shutter offers. Um, an electronic device that will automatically shut off the stove or shut off the burners on the top of the stove once they've been on too long. Who knew that this stuff was around there? So what you want to, so you want to kind of, you want to look, and then once again, you want to make sure that, that areas that have medicines, alcohol, matches are locked, right? This is a big concern if you've got a person who is a smoker, right? You want to make sure there aren't a lot of matches lying around, right? I realize it's going to be very difficult that anybody, for anybody to stop smoking. I heard one of the suggestions, well, just hide the cigarettes. But then you end up with a person who maybe forgot that they smoked, but they're really angry all the time because they're not smoking. So but the, you, the, the question is, what do you want to do? On areas like kitchens and bathrooms, you want to be locking medicine cabinets. You want to be using grab bars as much as possible. And regarding those grab bars, you want to be making sure that the grab bars are installed with like two by fours inside, not just any place on the wall, so that if you go to grab the grab bar, it's not going to just kind of pull off of the wall, right? So you really want to be looking at them room by room. Um, the same thing goes with lighting. There are lighting fixtures that you can buy to make sure that there is sufficient night lights at night that you can kind of point people in the correct directions. 
you can use tape for that, you can use a lot of other devices. Finally, you want to make sure, and this is, by the way, one of the hardest ones, you want to make sure if your spouse is, progress is progressing, if your spouse has Alzheimer's, that, you, that the neighbors know. Now, that's one of the hardest things because typically you don't want the neighbors to know because you're kind of embarrassed about this. But if your spouse is out and the neighbors know that she has some problems or that he has some problems, they're going to respond to that. Otherwise, they're going to figure, oh, you know, I hate to be bothering anybody. They may not be doing it. And I know that there, Kevin Marshall from the Nantucket Police Force has spoken here before about the Safe Return Program, the number of programs that they actually have here in Nantucket um, to make people safe, where you can actually sign up with the police department and they'll have a picture so that they'll know if, they, if, if, your, if your loved one is wandering, if they find somebody, they'll know who they are. So they'll know how to be able to get them back home. So there are a lot of possibilities regarding what you can do to make your house safe. The question, if you're Frank and Mary, is how do you pay for those? If you're Frank and Mary, you've got a house. If you're in Nantucket, that house may be worth more than $400,000. Um, and you've got some cash, but at the same time, if you're Frank and Mary and you're 70 years old and this is happening to Mary, the question is, well, is, is the money gonna last until I die? Are we gonna have enough money to make it until I die? That's, once again, that's kind of one of the issues with elder law, helping people figure out how to not go broke before they die. If they're worried about that, and if you're Frank and Mary, then that may be where you want to consider a reverse mortgage. Now, I never recommend reverse mortgages for people as a matter of course. I've seen people, actually specifically here in Martha's Vineyard, who really got kind of, I don't want to say sold a bill of goods, but folks that retired 62, you can qualify for a reverse mortgage, they just didn't want to deal with the fact that their income was going down because of the fact that they were going on Social Security. And so they tapped into the equity in their home, which is, there's a lot around here, in order to make up that gap. And I've seen people that did that, but now it's 10 years later, or it's 15 years later, and they're out of money. And all they have is their home, and there is no cash, and now they can't afford to be in their home, but as soon as they move out of their home, they have to sell it, because those are the terms of the reverse mortgage. It's all, it's not good. On the other hand, if you're Frank and Mary, and the goal of your life is to stay home, and you don't feel that you want to tap into your, your fairly small amount of cash, this isn't a bad idea. Basically, you get a reverse mortgage. You don't pull any money out of that reverse mortgage. I was just talking to a lady earlier, actually here, before I started, who had come because we were just kind of talking about some of these issues. And I mentioned to her, she's, a, she's, on, you know, she's on Social Security, and that's it. And she has a small house here and very little in savings. And I said, well, you know, you may want to consider a reverse mortgage. And she said, well, but if I get a reverse mortgage, th then doesn't that disqualify me for all these you know, government programs? I said, no. I said, you, if you get a reverse mortgage and you leave the reverse mortgage as a line of credit so that you haven't pulled all of the money out, right? You can use that as you need it to fix up your house, et cetera, right? While at the same time not losing any of your benefits. So you can get a reverse mortgage, the upfront costs of these things are high, but you can, typically, you can finance them as part of the reverse mortgage money that you're, that you're borrowing, and then not use the other money unless you have to. So reverse mortgage is 101. So reverse mortgages are based on three things. The value of the house, except um, reverse mortgages, there is a ceiling to that value, and that ceiling is $625,000 if, if you have a house that's worth more than that. Only in Nantucket does it happen that a lot of people have houses that are worth more than that. Um, they will only consider the value of up to 625000 Then they will calculate an amount that they will lend you based on your age. The older you are, the greater the percentage of the value of the property they will lend you, uh, and based on the current interest rate. So for example, today, if Frank and Mary today went to borrow uh, and they had a house that was worth $400,000, then they would be entitled to a reverse mortgage of as much as $245,000. Um, the closing costs on that reverse mortgage are stiff, right? It's $16,500 approximately is what the points on the closing costs would cost. And by the way, you've seen the ads for reverse mortgages on TV, or, you may, or maybe somebody's called you and solicited you. Let me tell you, they're all the same. 
They're, I mean, with very, very little exception, they are all the same. The reason for that is that the reason why banks are willing to re lend on a reverse mortgage basis where they're not getting their monthly payments is if, if it happens that the amount that ends up being owed on the reverse mortgage exceeds the value of the house, the federal government pays them.